Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eduardo Nunez. I'm with uh, Welcome to the Princeton Reviews uh, webinar on how to write a compelling medical school personal statement, getting personal with your personal statement. Uh, I'm with the national marketing team here in New York, and I am pleased to uh, be here with our presenter, Anita Pascal, uh, and just a couple of housekeeping notes um, or, or comments, rather. Uh, everyone is muted, so if anyone has any questions, please use the menu bar on the GoTo uh, webinar menu bar, and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions. Um, and please know that this webinar is being recorded, um, so anything that we discuss, we'll be able to email to you within 48 hours. Um, it will be sent over, and if there are any questions that we can't get to for any reason, um, then we'll follow up with you individually. Um, and uh, again, welcome to uh, the Princeton Review, and I'll pass it over to Anita, who's going to get us started and uh, tell us a little bit about herself. Thank you so much. Okay, so getting personal with your personal statement. So it is March 20th. That means a month and a half, less than a month and a half from now, we are going to see the opening of AMCAS and ACOMAS, and in two and a half months, it's going to be the opening day for submission of AMCAS applications. And I know this is always a tense time for people when they come into this, and the thing that people freak out the most about is personal statement and interview. And the funny part is, and I, I wanna put that a little bit in perspective, is that your personal statement's only going to get reviewed if you pass a couple of other thresholds. So you want to pass those thresholds, and then when you get through that, you want to make the most of it. So today's topic is really to help you focus in on how to generate a personality in your personal statement, so to speak. Next month, we're gonna be talking about how you best frame your experiences for success. Um, and those are the two main parts of your application, your primary application, outside of your GPA and your test score and your letters of recommendation. So we kinda of wanna focus in on all of those, and I wanna give you the tips on the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. So let's start, I mean, how the heck do I even know what I'm talking about? So let me give you a little insight. I have been, I'm like a dinosaur. I've been doing this forever. I've been doing advising at both the R1, D1 level at the university base, as well as working with five medical, five MD programs and two osteopathic programs now for a total of almost 20 years. So like I said, I'm a dinosaur. I have counseled over 10,000 students. Um, my background and sort of what I want to tell you guys that I bring to this is, and by the way, um, my name is, Dr. Pascal, but I go by Anita. I'm very informal and I like it that way. So if you guys correspond and interact with me, it's, I really want to know that the students that I work with, it's very much a teamwork friendship thing. This is not me standing up here going, this is what you need to do. I want you guys to use my background and my experience because first of all, I am an MD. I have been where you guys have been. I've been that that gunner pre-med student that we all hate. Everybody always talks about pre-meds because we always seem we're so over ambitious to get everything done. The problem is, is that we're looking at such a ridiculously competitive field that most people don't appreciate. When you look at applications on an average year, we're going to get probably between 50,000 and 56,000 applications into AMCAS. The average medical school is going to get about 10,000 applications to fill their roughly 100 slots. So it's a huge, overwhelming thing. The average acceptance to med school is about 40 to 42 percent. So the truth is, more people are going to get denied than are actually going to get in. The average med school is trying to weed through 10,000 applications to pick out maybe the 300 they're going to interview to offer slots for those hundred slots. So it's key in all aspects of how you frame your application. So I run into uh, several problems. One of the things that I run into is students get so focused in and dialed down on their GPA and their MCAT. And they get so focused in on making that the best that they omit the other parts of their application. Please don't get me wrong, your GPA and your MCAT are going to be the first two metrics that schools screen on. 
So the good and the bad is that many kids focus so much on that that they don't get these other things over here done that they need to do. So they come to their application unprepared with a beautiful test score and a beautiful MCAT that's going to get them through a screen, but they don't have the other stuff. The counter perspective is I have lots of kids who really, really do try to become that well-rounded student who have strong aspects on the metrics, but are also doing the other things they need to do. And they may end up with a lopsided GPA or MCAT. Well, if that's your initial screen, it may not matter how much all this beautiful, glorious, you know, clinical experience and volunteering or whatever is over here. If you don't have the baseline to get through the screen, they're never going to see all that. So the first thing is before you ever sit down to write your personal statement, you need to take stock of who you are as an applicant. Okay. So what is your GPA? What is your MCAT score? Is that going to get you through the screen? And when you get through the screen, what is the story that you have to tell? And so I often watch people get really, really caught up in writing their personal statement because they say, I have no idea what to say about me. I, I don't seem to have the things done that I need to get in. Well, that's a personal self-reflection that the first thing out the gate is you need to figure out what you bring to the table. OK, you can want it in your gut as much as you want to. OK, but if you don't have what it takes, you need to make yourself the best applicant you can, because remember, you're going up against. 50,000 plus other students. You're going up against 10,000 students at a school. So the first thing is taking stock of all of that. And I've been right there where you guys are. And I'm going to share a story with you in just a minute to sort of help you understand that. But I've been where you are. I was that pre-med student who was trying to get all my eggs in my basket to apply. I had a beautiful GPA. And the first time I took my MCAT, they didn't tell me I was supposed to study. And I bombed it, like I bombed it bad, like right at the 500 level, if it was today's MCAT. And I remember going to sit in the dean's office at UNC Chapel Hill, where I ultimately went to med school. And I sat down in front of the dean, much like a lot of little gunner pre-meds, because I was like, if I just sit in front of the dean, they'll want me. And I now look back and go, man, face palm, how stupid was I? And he sat down and he looked at me and he listened very politely to my story. And then he said, hmm, MCAT, so what else do you want to do with your life? And I had this sudden realization that I wasn't going to med school. So I did have to regroup. And I didn't cry myself a river of, oh, my goodness, but I've got all this other stuff. Why don't you want me? I went back and I reprepped and I retook my MCAT and I got a very strong score and prepared myself. So the first thing is taking personal stock. Where am I? OK, and then go to that next step, which we're going to talk about in our 10 tips. So, all right. Yes, I have an MD. I went to UNC Chapel Hill. My background is family medicine, reproductive health and family planning. I did a master's in education and a couple of PhDs. Guys, don't be impressed. I didn't want to get a job. The key thing is, is I've been there. I've been there trying to apply. I have been the advisor to hundreds thousands of pre-med students. And then I've been that person sitting in the admissions committee office, listening to your stories, reading your personal statements. And the first thing that I need to let you know is that we're looking at 10,000, maybe a couple of thousand personal statements every year, people who make it through the screen. We hear the same thing over and over. How do you make yourself different? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about the importance of your personal statement. I'm going to give you 10 key points to think about when writing your personal statement. And I'll be honest with you, they're going to seem pretty straightforward. It's like, well, frick, of course I understand that. But if you step back and you read the personal statements, and I was actually reading one right before I started this, I see every one of those same mistakes. And then how can we help you better craft who you are? All right, so before I get started, if you guys could just do me a quick favor, I need to kind of know, okay, my poll's not opening. Why is my poll not opening? Okay, open up, come on, come with me. Uh, launch, there we go, technology. It, 
just bites sometimes. Can you guys let me know where you are? Have you already applied? Are you getting ready to apply this upcoming cycle? Are you applying in the next application cycle or somewhere in the future? So next application cycle in the future or this coming one. So that gives me some idea. So I'm hoping that means maybe the one that is coming up regardless. If you're not applying to the 2021 cycle, this is a perfect time because it's gonna give you guys lots of insight. If you're getting ready to apply this June, please please listen to these tips. Okay, so sitting on the admissions committee side, oftentimes, if you make it through that initial screen, your personal statement, your secondary essays, and I cannot stress this enough, and I will be doing a webinar on secondary essays in July, as well as your interview can count up to 60% or more of your total scoring when we sit in the admissions committee chamber. Now, let me put that in perspective though, okay? What that means is if you apply, okay, the first thing is gonna be whether or not you make it through the screen. So if you make it through the initial metrics of GPA and MCAT, almost 100% of schools, the second screen is your experiences, okay? Keep this in perspective. The 15 AMCAS experiences or ACOMAs are generally put through an electronic screen. That electronic screen weights all of your experiences based on the different categories of AMCAS, the number of hours, and the total exposure length of time. So it's gonna give a weighting to how many service things did they list, how many research things, how many clinical exposure, paid and unpaid, and weight that overall. Key things we're looking for is, how many hours of clinical exposure? If you are a heavy research institution that you're applying to, how much research experience does that person have? Service is the next thing in line. So if you write out your 15 experiences and you're trying to group them together so that you can get 15 listed, then you've probably done enough. If you're struggling and having to list every individual shadowing experience, you're trying to list Dean's List honors as one of your experiences, you may not make it through that second level screen for somebody to even look at your personal statement. But let's say you've brought everything together and you do feel solid on the things you do to a bring to the table. How do you craft the best personal statement? So the number one thing that I, where is my, there's my arrow, is what is the first thing that we need to do in writing that personal statement? It's write, rewrite, let it sit, and rewrite again. And I know that sounds really kind of straightforward. It's kind of like when you're writing an essay. But students that I'm currently working with who are doing admissions counseling packages with me, I expect their personal statement to be written over a five to six month period. Now I realize we're in March and that really doesn't allow that for June, but it doesn't mean that you're so far behind that you can't catch up. Okay, but I see over and over students go, but I had to focus on the MCAT and I had to get everything done and I'm just so busy with school and, 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 and I'm like, and you've been preparing three or four years to write this personal statement. A reflection of who you are and why you wanna be doing this. This is not something that is crafted in one sitting. It is not crafted over a two week period. It is something that you formulate a draft and then you rewrite it and you set it for a period of time and you write it again and you have people who know and don't know you review it until you feel that it is tight enough. Now that sounds pretty straightforward, but there's really a whole lot more to it than that. So what are my 10 key points? One of the first things that I tell students is if I was to sit down and ask you, why do you want to be a physician? Tell me why you want to be a physician. I hear, and it's funny because one of our intake questions when I start to work and counsel with a new student is, tell me a little bit about your journey to med school. Swear to you all, nine times out of 10, I get, I really, really enjoy science. I've always been inquisitive about how things work. I really want to relate and interrelate with people and make a difference in people's lives. And my grandfather or my Nana got sick at some point in time and I wanna be able to help people just like them. And it is this to me at the admission committee side. 
because it is the exact same thing that every student articulates. It's like the go-to. It is the progressive auto insurance commercial that says the exact same thing over and over and over, and we tune it out. If you guys ever like watch a sports show or something, and it seems like people buy ads and you see the same commercial eight times, in a single show and then you just completely tune it out after the second time. That's how those types of personal statements radiate to us. So I want to give you some of the tips to avoid this because don't get me wrong, those are reasons you should be bringing to the table of why you want to become a physician. But you've got to figure out how you articulate that and what is said. So the first is what I just mentioned. Number one, back off the cliches. It is some people feel just this overbearing need to tell us how much you want to help and serve and love science and somebody died and you want to help all the underserved people in the world. Again, great aspirations, but people really can't articulate more behind that. Okay, it needs to go so much deeper than this. The other thing I often get people, a mistake that people make is they get so focused on trying to make a presentation about somebody. For instance, their grandpa died. And I read three fourths of a personal statement about grandpa. This is not grandpa's personal statement, this is yours. And it is great to mention it, but there is a reason that AMCAS gives you 5,300 characters counting spaces. We want to say, if you see if you can articulate in 5,300 characters why this journey is important to you. Do not use the cliches that make me turn off or look away immediately. All right. Be interesting, okay? Admissions committee members are looking for a new view of the world, but more importantly, we are, we're not looking for the, like some earth shadowing, you know, revelation. We are looking for a view into who you are as a person, okay? I need you to wrap your head around the aspect that we know nothing about you, okay? We have some numbers, we have some stuff tabulated and experiences, but we have no personal connection to you. So your personal statement is the opportunity to kind of stir a gut feeling within us. And that needs to be a positive gut feeling. It needs to be intriguing. It needs to be something that is unique about you. And it does not have to be, I discovered the cure of cancer. It can be an experience. It can be something that happened in your journey, okay? I remember when I started my personal statement, and I have to tell you guys, this gives you some idea of how old I am, and by the way, I turn 55 next month, so that'll tell you something. Anyway, when I wrote my personal statement on my typewriter using those little whiteout things to mess it, and I typed it on a piece of paper and mailed it to AMCAS, yeah, I'm a dinosaur, I remember starting my personal statement with an aspect of how, in reflection, I had always been told by my father that in our journey in life that we would be impacted by the people that we met, the things that occurred in our lives, and their impact of us on our journey along the way. And he told me that I had been gifted with way more than I deserved, and he aspired for one thing for me, it was to find a way to give back. And I don't know where I started with this because when I first went to college, I was actually a chemical engineering major because according to the course catalog, that's what made the most money, and an architectural design student because I really, really liked architectural design. I dropped that chemical engineering the second major um, right after I entered engineering physics because Lord how mercy I had no concept of that whole physics thing like if there was a monkey in the tree and you shot him out of the tree with what velocity did that monkey hit the ground I did not care I was a scientist and I wanted to dissect him I later learned that about myself so anyway I was an architectural design major and about my third year of architectural design I was like you know this is really great but I'm not really jiving with it and so at that point I was kind of like, now what am I going to do with myself? Now, I grew up in a very underserved community, and I worked three jobs throughout college to put myself through college. And one of the jobs that I got 
in high school that I worked throughout college about 35 hours a week in addition to going to school was that I got to be, my father got me a job as an MA in a burn unit in a hospital. And when I started to sort of reflect on why I wanted to do, what I wanted to do with my life, I was like, you know, I, one of the things I get the most enjoyment out of is helping people in the burn unit just like you guys. It was like, oh, I really do like science and I really want to help and serve people. So I was like, I shall go to medical school. Literally went home one weekend, told my parents, I'm going to medical school. I thought they were going to just pass out on the floor because I'd never mentioned it. But anyway, so I'm back in the burn unit and I remember I did all of that stuff I was supposed to do. I went and did my shadowing, did my volunteering, everything. I'm in the burn unit the summer that I'm applying to med school. And we had a patient that came into the burn unit. Um, he had been in a car with his wife. They were newlyweds and they were on their way home from the airport. And they were hit head on by a drunk driver. And he was ejected from the car and he woke up to find the car on fire and his wife was trapped in the car. So he went back to pull her out and he actually saved her life, but he was burned over 75% of his body, second and third degree burns. That particular summer, he had been in our burn unit for almost two months on a ventilator. We were trying to, you know, bring him back. And this particular day that stood out in my mind we had taken him off the ventilator and it was the first day that he was able to verbalize and actually talk with his wife and she was in his room with him while I was doing a dressing change on his arm and I I, I still remember it like it was yesterday and they were talking and he was talk. they were talking about wanting to go on a second honeymoon they were um, he said he'd have to wear like a big sombrero to keep all the sun off of him and he talked about um, how he was afraid when he would go home that he might scare their little pet dog and how excited he was to see his wife because I mean his mother because he asked his wife he said do you think I will frighten my mom by my appearance and she said honey your mother has been here every day so they had talked for like 30 minutes and this whole time I'm sitting there doing his dressing change going this is why I'm gonna be a physician I'm gonna make these people better I'm gonna help and serve them look at how all this stuff is happening and he looked at her after about 30 minutes and he told her that he was tired and he asked her to go get him a milkshake from the cafeteria to protein milkshake to help him. And she puffed up like some kind of peacock because she was so excited about doing something for him. And she walked out the door and I remember watching him never take his eyes off of her. She walked to the elevator. She pushed the button, the elevator doors open and he, she stepped into the elevator and she turned around and realized that she could see him staring at her. So she blew him a kiss and he blew her a kiss and he said, I love you and the elevator doors closed and by this point tears were streaming down my face and he turned around and he looked at me and he was like i don't know you i don't remember you but i guess you've been here helping me and i just want to say thank you and i was like then i puffed up like a peacock and i wasn't doing jack i was just an ma but i sure did feel awful good about myself and then he turned and he looked the other way and he took a really deep breath and then his ekg flatlined he coded sitting right there in front of me, lying there before me. And they brought the whole team in and they ran the code and ultimately he expired before his wife got back up that day. And I remember that I clocked out. I couldn't deal with it. I was like, what have I chosen as a career? I can't do this for a living. I, two days later, I came back into the burn unit. It still had just rocked me to the core. And my attending pulled me aside and he went, you don't get it, do you? And I was like, I'm getting fired. And he said, you are probably the best MA that we've ever had in our burn unit. You're great with procedures. I have listened to you talk about how you will help people make a difference, serve all these people. You're going to be a plastic surgeon, which by the way, y'all saw I didn't. And he said, medicine is not about you. It's not about our treatments. It is not, he said, we have the most incredible career in the world because in our career, we get insight into people's lives. We get to share that journey with people, not our patients. And I think that's the first time I ever reflected back on it like that. And I started to reflect on what I was doing. And he said, you had a patient. And he said, we knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to die. I wish someone had told me this, but he fought to get to a point to share those moments with his wife 
and then he let go. And he said, but in that patient you were treating, there was a person and that person had a life. He had a wife who now had to go on without him. He had a mother who did not get a chance to say goodbye. There was a little dog at home who wonders why he never came home. It is a reflection of who we are and what we do and what has happened to you in your life to help you know this is the right field for you. And it does not have to be something as dramatic as what happened to me. One of my students the other week was relating to how he delivers meals with Meals on Wheels and getting to a man's house. And as the man beamed with a smile across his face, he was like, I want to show you something. And he walked away to show this guy how he had made a makeshift cane to help himself get around. He realized that, yes, he delivered meals, but he was also delivering companionship and how this guy just wanted somebody to share with. I had another student who worked at, um, a, at a play school and she said she remembered a little kid who skinned her knee and she was so excited to be the doctor and to run up and to share, to bandage the little girl's knee and she was so excited about that that she never took a moment to talk to the little girl to look up to see the horror on her face in terror and how she took a moment to let the little girl clean her wound to relate to the person not the patient think about why you need this and what radiates in your gut and if you speak from your gut about you your personal statement will be just that a personal statement and that is why it is not crafted in 25 minutes or one writing it is multiple renditions so find a way that is intriguing and interesting think about the best book or the best show that you've ever watched if any of you guys have not seen newsroom google for the opening clip to newsroom it catches your attention and it wants you to know what happens afterwards. Be that engaging. Show, don't tell, which is exactly what I just showed you. So many, many times I read personal statements. First of all, don't you ever start your personal statement with I and go back through your personal statement and see how many times you start sentences or talk about I and show me don't tell me. We talk about what I call politicians answers. It is, I am empathetic. I am understanding. I am compassionate. Yeah. And don't, don't tell me that. Show it to me. Share examples. Explain things you've done that show you are that compassionate, giving, empathetic, understanding person. Okay. Don't ramble, which I feel like I do sometimes. But there is a reason, like I told you, that we are given you 5,300 characters. We want to see, can you create a picture, a story, or a visual image without rambling? Avoid five-line sentences. There are often times where I'm going, holy cow, there ain't been a period in this for a paragraph. Okay, remember, we don't know you, okay? I get people who all the time go, well, my mom read it, my dad, well, they know you. Get somebody who knows nothing about you and see if they can follow your train of thought. See if it's clear and see if you use correct grammar. And there are words that I hate and despise to see in personal statements outside of I. I, the word got, I got this, I got that, um, I learnt. We don't, I know that learned and learnt can both be used in the English dictionary, but I can tell you it makes admissions committees prickly. In that moment, oh my goodness, if I read one more personal statement, and in that moment, I realized what my journey needed to be. Nobody came down with a little wand, whacked you on the head and said, boing, in that moment, you know you want to be a physician. It has not happened to anybody in the history of time. It is growth and evolution. Address your weaknesses and move on. Um, I get this question a lot. Um, if I had a bad semester, if I had something that I messed up with, if there is the elephant in the room and you have chosen not to address it, and I, I fight this battle all the time, if your baseline metrics 
be that your GPA or your MCAT score, are way outside the bounds of what schools look for, but you are still danged and determined, you really want them to see you. And I always encourage students to address those weaknesses before they start. But if they're still out there, you need to address them. Maybe you had a really, really bad semester because somebody in your family got injured, you had to work an additional job, you had to take a semester off because of something. You address that, but it should always be in a positive fashion. It should be no more than a small component of your paragraph and you need to move on and you should always show how you grew from it. If you are a re-applicant, your revised personal statement must include an acknowledgement of how you messed up the first time and how you have grown since your first application. You'll expand on that in secondaries, but you need to address it and acknowledge it in your new personal statement. Watch your transitions. Oh my goodness, because I'm in the thick of reviewing personal statements and experiences from the students I'm mentoring right now. And it is amazing to me. We generally say that you should approach your personal statement as five to six core paragraphs. We'll talk about that later. But basically, you should, you've got 5,300 characters. There needs to be a catch, okay? Your catch has got to be, and we'll talk about it, something that's going to catch my attention that makes me want to read additional paragraphs. And it should be some type of theme that sort of radiates throughout your personal statement. And that can be anything of your choosing. Now, it should be, I just finished reading a dental personal statement where the, the kid actually started with, the first sound I heard was thud. The next thing I heard was a scream, realizing it was my own personal scream as I tripped over the feet of my fellow basketball player smashing into the ground and shattering my front five teeth. And that was his general, his general intro about how he would then have a very positive experience with the orthodontist and the surgeon who took care of him and kind of how it changed his life. For him, it was more a reflection of realizing how one's smile really determines a lot about how we feel about ourselves and how for weeks on end, he was afraid to open his mouth for how people looked at him. And so what is your catch? Counter perspective to that, I read one the other day where it said, as I stared between the gaping holes of her leg, blood spurted from her as I caught the baby as it shot out. I was like, okay, little TMI. So make sure it's appropriate. Now, once you give your catch, there should be three to four paragraphs that tell your journey. Ideally, one needs to be clinical because I need to know you have some clinical understanding of where you've been. And ideally, because it is such a service-driven field, something that reflects your dedication to service, even if it's related to clinical. And it should be something unique. Again, we're looking at who you are and how's that told in your story. So you use three to four paragraphs to reflect on different things in your journey. And then your final paragraph and conclusion should reflect back from your start with a challenge moving forward. Well, there are days where I read personal statements and it's like I'm reading four different personal statements because the transition from one paragraph takes me to another and I have no idea how we got from there to there. So think about it. If any of you guys are Walking Dead fans or not fans any longer and you watch the beginning episode and then you came into an episode now and you're going, whoa, what happened in the past four seasons? You have no idea what's going on. For my husband and I, it's more common that we sit down to watch something on TV. I fall asleep 10 minutes into it. We watch the next night, um, the next in the series. And I'm like, what, what's going on? So make sure your transitions provide a natural flow. Again, watching starting any paragraph or sentence as much as possible with I. All right, use the active voice. Avoid writing in third person. This always cracks me up because I was like, somebody will go, she stood there or whatever. And I'm going, she, you, who, whose is this? And be active, be engaging, and also be conscious of your verb tenses. If you're talking about a program that you work in and it's like their, their goal was, oh, are they not in existence anymore? Really watch for unique words, unique transitions, and to be in your active voice. 
seek multiple opinions. I've already talked about this, but before you hit submit, please, if you're not working with one of us, ask as many people as possible for feedback, okay? We get way, way, way too close to this. Our brain automatically, and sometimes we've written and rewritten it so many times that there may be errors there, and we skip right over them because our brain is reading what we think we're seeing. Okay, so please make sure, especially get somebody who really doesn't know you that well, to read your personal statement and to give you an honest opinion, even if they're not talking about the content, does it follow a logical flow? Focus, 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 okay? Sometimes there is just a journey, and I got one the other day of a student who I had onboarded, I went through all of his experiences and I generally break experiences into six main categories and within those categories there are subcategories and when I did their personal intake evaluation there were like two entries in all of those categories that's really really bad I'm generally looking for 15 to 20 so I knew there was a lot of work to be done. I had advised to potentially wait to another cycle. This person was really determined, really, really. So I get the first draft of their personal statement. It was 27,000 characters long. Remember, 5,327,000. And I was like, holy cow, what are we writing about? You haven't done anything. And the response I got back was, I am trying to best reflect what I bring to the table. And I went, well, I sure you hope you captured it because I didn't see it and all of that. And it literally was a montage of his life pretty much from infancy through high school where it stopped. Your journey can be a reflection of something early on, but we're really hoping to see what you've done in this realization to indemnify why this is the right career for you. And I'm pretty sure what you did as a five-year-old is not reflective of that. So make sure your personal statement highlights interesting aspects of your journey. We are not expecting you to tell your entire life story. Also remember, you have your experiences to be reflective, and more importantly, secondaries will allow you to expand on these. These should catch our attention. And mind the four R's, even though I kind of fudged on that one R. Write, review it, revise it, repeat. Wince, rush, and repeat. Do it over and over and over until you really feel satisfied with it, but by the same token, you need to know when there is time to fish or cut bait, okay? Your personal statement should not take 90% of the time of putting together your application. You should give equal or more time to your experiences, and you also need to know if you're struggling too much, is that something within your gut? Are you not ready? And do not hold up your application. Again, you should be working on that now so that when May comes, you can be inputting all of your information to best apply and be ready, if at all possible, to submit when opening day comes up. Remembering that you can add, te test scores can come in afterwards, your letters of recommendation can come in after you submit, but it is an ongoing process. You have to be verified. And it is also about 85% of schools do acceptances on a rolling basis. So the sooner you get it done, and I talk to people every year who go, I go, why did you not submit till August? I couldn't get my personal statement just right. Well, that's not our fault. That's yours. You've spent three, four plus years getting here and you are three months behind because you couldn't articulate it. That's on you because when you've got a patient dying in front of you, you can't go, oh, wait a minute, I got to go figure out, make a decision. How am I going to articulate it? We need to know that you can respond. So, pointers be wary of your word count, keep that in mind, take a systematic approach. I always recommend people first sort of start with a journey and key points in their life, sort of write that out, then write out an outline of all the possible things that might compose a paragraph, figure out which ones might fit best, use that five point approach, what's gonna be my catch, what are gonna be my supporting paragraphs, and how can I reflect back to that and summarize at the end? 
All right, one more poll before we get started. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about things. And I want to take some, some questions that you may have out there or you may not have any. So let me get to my next poll. Hopefully it will actually want to open for me. Um, do any of you guys have any interest in learning more about um, how to prepare for the MCAT, how I might be able to help you navigate the admissions process or things that we can do to help you boost your GPA. If you are, just click on one of those and we can get information back to you. I wanna take a little bit of time to talk more to you about what we actually have here. So what we have at the Princeton Review, and then I'm gonna take some questions if there are any, if not, <laughs> We're good. Um, there are three main components to an application. You have got to get good grades. Tutor.com is available 24 seven to help you with those questions. If you're like me, because I hated physics, it was always like at midnight when I was sitting down to try to study and go, okay, now I have no idea how to answer this. Obviously can't call my professor, let me try that. Great test scores, that goes without saying. I've already told you, your GPA and your MCAT are gonna get you through. We are experts in this field of helping people prepare for their MCAT, be it you wanna test on your own, you wanna test, you wanna um, get guided help, you want a seated class or whatever. And then admissions counseling. You've put all this work in and people go, I've got this under control. The biggest mistakes I make, and I can tell you from my students who this year, who were reapplicants, and I've taken them, 90% of the reapplicants I worked with who did not get in last year, who got in this year, I didn't change a whole lot about their journey, I changed the way that they packaged and present themselves. Understand what we're looking on on the side. I'm here to help you guys with that, along with my team. All right, so with that said, um, and this is some information I can help you with your primary. Many people are like, I just really want help with my personal statement. And what you guys need to understand is that your secondary, your interview prep, how you follow up with schools is as important, if not more important than the primary application. So really that comprehensive focus, start to finish and getting in. And there we have premier counseling, which is where you work 100% with me all the way from start to finish to get you into the schools you want to get into. Okay, with that said, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take any. If not, I'm going to turn you loose for the rest of the day. Um, Ed, do I have any questions? Hey, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for that great presentation. Uh, right now, we don't have any questions, um, and I just want to announce that if, if you guys have any questions later on, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, obviously, Anita is, is a great person to talk to. She's very experienced and, uh, and approachable. So definitely reach out to us. We're more than happy to help. And if those of you who signed up for the webinar but did not actually get to um, log in with us today, because I know you'll receive the link later on, if you have specific questions after watching this video, please feel free to go to questions at review.com and email them to us, and they will get those messages to me for feedback to you guys. The other thing is, if you go to the Princeton Review Admissions Counseling website or just Google for it, this may help you really take stock of yourself. I actually have an online quiz that you can take and it allows you to enter in the things you've done or whatever and at the end you can get a score on kind of where you stand in terms of being prepared and we have a whole host of counselors out there that if you'd like to schedule a time for them to kind of give you some feedback or connect you with one of us we're more than happy to talk to you well and I'd like to thank you for the time today and the assistance in this webinar uh, please go to our webinar page um, and take a look at some of my upcoming webinars again next month we're going to be listing that one soon but I'm going to be doing a webinar on talking about how to make the most of your experiences and that's really important in May I'm going to be talking about osteopathic medicine the DO route I get lots of people who I ask are you applying to osteopathic programs as well and they're like I don't really understand understand them and I'm going to be co-hosting a webinar with um, an admissions uh, representative actually the, the Dean of Admissions from a well-known osteopathic program to really answer those questions um, and funny enough um, one of the things I'm going to be talking about in June 
is how do you become that star applicant? We're going to have opening day and what are the things that make you stand out? I'll show you some of the things that we look for. July, I'll be talking about secondaries and how to make the most of those. And in um, August, we're going to be getting you ready for the interview. So stay with me through the whole journey throughout this. Join our monthly webinars and take advantage of what we have to offer. Um, okay, guys, um, I think we're going to sign off for now, but thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone.